So um, I want to talk about how we go about engaging communities and how the um, SIG HPC education chapter has been working with the High Performance Computing Certification Forum um, and some of the lessons that we've, that we've learned. I have a ton of discussion questions at the end, hoping for a lot of discussion. So I want to just give an overview of the Special Interest Group High Performance Computing Education chapter. We have a number of committees. Um, we have a workshop committee that, you know, does exactly what, what that says. They coordinate workshops that we give at ISC, at Supercomputing, at PERC, which is local in the U.S., and they would also work on Asia-Pacific workshops um, if we had someone who wanted to come and work with us. Computational Science Education works at formal content creation and, and the various pieces that you could add into a course. So this is these would be the content creators that um, that Julian was speaking of earlier. The Education Content Committee, which is the committee that David Henty and I uh, chair, is really looking at finding available education and training materials that focus on HPC and computational science skills and sort of bringing those together in one place. The Outreach Committee just basically gives an update of what we're doing. The K-12 committee is now looking, this is a newer committee, they're looking at introducing HPC and data science in pre-university systems. And then we have a systems professional committee, which is primarily focused on systems administrators because the skills that they need, many of which are listed under the skills, the, uh, the mind map that Julian showed, the skills that they need are not taught as part of an IT background. So where do they find the, the skills and the training that they need? So and our website is, is there. Just briefly, there are a number of resources on our website. I just want to give you an overview of who we are, so I really want to delve into bringing the communities together. So the Education Content Committee is really focused on informal learning. And after we had reviewed and gathered resources from HPC centers around the world, we A, wanted to make it the discovery easier, but we also wanted to find a way to figure out which resources are really valuable. How do they connect? Are they specific to one? Some of them are specific to one type of center. They're all open. Um, they're all open source, so we don't have anything where you're paying for a college course. But some of them are very specific and some of them are very general. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we're looking for a way to find out how useful they are. At the same time, the HPC Certification Forum is focused on finding a way to help people, A, find their own um, resources and a way to know sort of how to put that together for themselves to learn what they need and be and validate that they know what they need, which is really what the assessments and the certification says. It says, I learned something. Yes, I have it. Um, and you created a very nice, well-defined, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to have some water, a well-defined set of skills that are necessary for HPC practitioners, whether they're users or system administrators. Um, and it, so it seems our set of resources to be able to somehow match those up with the skills was a really was something that we really wanted to get involved in and then beyond that um, crowdsourcing not only definitions of skills but also these assessments so the work we've done so far in the fall of 2019 julian gave us an, an introduction um, about the certification forum and we started talking about what we could do in November of 2019 at Supercomputing, we started discussing ways that we could really work together. And at that point, uh, we talked about sort of what business would call a minimal viable product, where from start to finish, from those leaf level skills down to the learning outcomes, down all the way, I realize you can't see my hands, <laughs> down all the way to the assessments, um, we wanted to get one whole piece, all of that, for one of those tree-level skills. And they, we felt that if we had that to show people, that you would then have, people would have an idea of where they could help and what the whole picture was supposed to look like. It would be a little more concrete. Often when you show some people something concrete, then they're able to better understand how they can be, how they can interact. 
So that was our recommendation back in November. So building that full minimal viable product, uh, the form selected use 1B and completed the full descriptions of the skills. So you can look on the website that Julian was, was showing it and you can see this whole list. So the next step then, now that all the skills and the sub skills, the outcome sub skills have been set up, is to, to sort of crowdsource a library of examination questions. And one way that we thought that the SIG education chapter, the education content committee could help was to really focus a crowd, you know, gather our crowd and focus them into building this library. So what happened? David and I got together and we said, let's just try it and see what happens. So we did. And we got a thank you for submitting your question. Now we have no idea where that went, what happened with it, whether it really went somewhere or just that when you hit submit, you get that thank you. Um, so we had a number of concerns as we did this. And one of them was when we looked at the blank sheet of questions, we suddenly realized we have no idea what questions already exist. Are we duplicating questions? Are, are all the questions bunched up in one type and uh, about one topic and not the others? Um, it's not clear what type of questions can be added. We added something that had, there were multiple answers that were correct. It looked like we could add that, but we don't know. Um, it's not clear what the question will look like when the student sees it. And there was no way to put a solution, a sort of explanation of what the right answer is. Um, and it's also not really clear why we were allowed to submit the question. Now, I've submitted things to, I submitted some learning objectives or some topics for the, for the forum, in, particu in particular um, for the term for using ECHO, which is what we wrote our question about, and the Linux command ECHO, I think maybe I've been added as a participant, but I don't know. I can't say to my committee, these are the steps you need to follow so that we can all add questions. So those were some of our, our concerns. Now, both of us come from an environment where we built courses for online learning. And in that, for, in that context, we have a huge variety of question formats. So I'm just going to go through a few, and I'm going to go through them quickly because I only have the 10 minutes, and I have too many slides. Um, so the first example is open edX. So, and this is an example of an open edX question. We're asking them, you know, what is the login node used for? And so that we, we have a number of formats that we can use. We can have multiple choice, true, false, multiple answers. In this case, it, you can see that it says check all that apply. This is a multiple answer question. Short answer, numerical process flows. If we want you to do something in a certain in a certain order, we can set the question up so that you have to put it in that order, just reinforcing that that's the order you do it in. And most online platforms provide a solution and explanation. So Socrative, which is used at EPCC, um, has many of the same. It has multiple choice, true, false, multiple answer, and free text. And furthermore, they also have a way to put the answer in. This is what we're, you know, a rough, a rough answer for people. So the next example is FutureLearn. It's another um, massively open online course platform like Open Ed, like Open edX. And here again, um, and in this case, the successful completion of many tests leads to a certificate from the from the platform from the course, just as Open edX or edX does. And you have detailed per question feedback that you can get. This looks like here, this is an open ended question, sort of a, a text, text formatted question. Finally, there's QA, uh, again used at EPCC. And, and the, the value of this one, as David would point out, is that you have a very large bank of questions. And when you go to set up an exam, you can say, okay, I want. 30% of my questions about compiling, 50% about the file system, and 20% about data. Now, if you were looking at data scientists, you might want data scientists who are using third-party code that's already built, packages. You might want, you know, 50% data, 30% file system, and another, what's it say, another 20% 
that's submitting package uh, submitting packages on the system. So furthermore, you know, depending on what people need to know in terms of working with a system, what do they need to know for Linux um, in a Linux background? Because that's the using the Linux system is the, the piece that we've been looking at. So here's a here's a real life problem. So given that you have a directory with hundreds of files in it, one way to process that is to have a job array in Slurm and, and start a job that will process it, it in high throughput that will process each and every file uh, and do whatever data processing you want to do on that. So that's not efficient. A, it's going to just, your scheduler is just going to be unhappy. But B, it's, it's not efficient use of a supercomputer, even if you all you need to do is a high throughput type job. So now imagine that I want to create a single file. I'm going to call it files to process, and it will include all the file names that are in that directory. Furthermore, I also want the number of file names in files to process so that I can distribute those files in chunks. And so now instead of having a thousand um, a job array with a thousand individual jobs. Now maybe I'm going to split it up and I'll have a hundred in each and I'll just start up whatever I'm going to do and it's going to churn through the files and process them and just write out each individual job. So a, a, a high throughput job but batched up. So this is a standard operation that data scientists need to do on our system in order to really take advantage of the concurrency in the parallel system. So in order to do this, you could do it. You could do it by parsing it with whatever language you're doing, which hopefully would be Python and not um, or Julia, um, and not like C or Fortran. But there may be other things that you want to that you want to do. So one way to do this is to use egrep, word count, and some piping, right? And you're going to put together a command. How do I craft a problem that accepts this whole command string and auto grades that expression? So that was another example that we that we found not and we're just throwing these out we're not we're not criticizing in any way we're just these are some of the questions that came up while we were doing it so for discussion um, really the question is what forms of problems need to be included in order for students to show mastery and feel as if they have actually uh, and, and feel that mastery, right? Sometimes when you just do a question and answer that are, that are just multiple choice, you're like, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know. But but you really want them to feel that mastery. Uh, what types of questions are hiring managers concerned about? Because if you take multiple choice and uh, true false and multiple answers, you know, I, someone who's a faculty member, they could pull out and like, oh, here's a bunch of good questions, and I'll just augment it with whatever else I need. And the same with someone who's going to put together a workshop. We all need different things from this. Um, and that's why the format, the way that it's set up, is quite nice, because as, as Julian said, there's no, there's no curriculum that's been placed there. It's a, a group of resources that somebody, when they're creating their own curriculum, can go to and say, oh, here are some good learning objectives, and here are some good matching skills. Um, and then there was, a, you know, where do these questions and problems live? Um, what is the process for getting permission to submit questions? And I understand that you don't want people to be able to see what the questions are, because then it will be like taking SAT exams in you know, in order, like they do here in the U.S., you have years of SAT exams. You take all of them so you've seen every single one. You can get a perfect score. That's not really what we're trying to do is teach people to the test. Well, but the people who are going to create the questions need to have some insight into what is currently in the library. Um, and when we submit the question, it would be very nice to understand what it looks like in the end for the student. You know, what is the student looking at? And maybe having a few times to maybe edit it a bit before we said final submission. So, you know, it's like preview and then final submission. And I understand this is a volunteer effort, so that's asking a lot. And what I showed, for examples, are all, um, they're all commercial. Uh, open edX is, is open, but there's a commercial side to that as well that's, that's pushing some of that. Um, and then... Um, you know, what is the process for reviewing and, and testing the library? Who is, is it just one person? Is it a group of people? Um, when we test the questions, how do we know that they work the way we think they do? 
and those are um, those are the questions I sort of want to leave as we go forward to discussion. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, really wonderful. And you brought up a really good questions. Um, I don't know if we should. I think we should wait on after we to answer some of the questions that you brought specifically um, to the HPC certification forum. I think we should answer them after we had Christian's talk in the discussion. But there are also probably other cool questions, many good questions for you that are more generic by the other audience. So is there uh, is there any question for the generic part of the talk? Hmm, I'm really I, I was find, like, was I, I close to my 10 minutes because I, I, I realized I was speaking very quickly and then I realized not everybody is is native English speaker and I need to slow down. So hopefully I didn't go too far over my 10 minutes. I felt great. I mean, I, I have a question regarding these other platforms um, and the existing questions that you mentioned, like the open edX and such. Um, how big do you expect is the pool of questions that, you know, is out there? So the way that the open edX platform works is that they have um, they can you can create a library bank of questions for some people it de and it depends on the course the, because mm -hmm. courses are you know people are creating them um, but there's certainly somebody at, at University of California Berkeley who has huge banks of questions because he's actually doing adaptive learning on that. So he's doing AI on that and helping the students say, okay, well, you seem to be having trouble with, you know, you seem to be able to look at the questions that they're struggling with and then back down and give them some more of those types to see if they finally understand. And if they don't, it's like you might, other people who have had trouble with this question have gone back, so, you know, recommendations for where to look to, re to revisit the information. So he's doing actual machine learning um, on those problem banks that he's created. So he has thousands of questions that are, you know, that, that are then randomized when they're given to students. And many of these courses that have been taught multiple times will have those sorts of thousands of questions. The edX ones may have that um, if you're getting the paid for version of the course so but it's very it depends very much on the instructor our courses currently don't have a lot one of the reasons that I find it might be easy for us to work with you uh, David Henty had the same comment is that we already have banks of questions that we could then share right we could take our if we knew what if we had a, an example of what you were looking for we could look at the ones that we have and just you know Port them into into the into the site, ready to go, because we already know them. They've been tested. The thing about online courses is that when you get back the data on how people have performed on a certain question, you can understand that. I don't think that question was written right because everybody's getting the same wrong answer. So you go back and you rewrite the question to make to clarify it. So we have some of those that have already been written, you know, tested out by students and clarified and be great to move those over if but again we don't are we are we just repeating what you already have are they in a format that, that you that's that will fit what you're uh, what you're using to deliver questions and, and those are some of the questions that we that we that we ran into I mean it was aside from the oh I guess we can add questions we're kind of surprised that we could just add them <laughs> so um Okay, no, great. Thank you. Let's discuss the and other both, one. Both David and I can talk more to the, because we've done a lot of this building, and, and Veronica mm. tomorrow as well, because she has done a lot of building for the Future Learn course. Oh, great. 